Welcome to the 2020 Pasadena Festival of Women Authors Online. I'm Nora Morley, the chairperson for the 2020 festival. Although we were unable to hold our event in person this year due to the coronavirus, we are so happy to present all seven of our festival authors online in videos like this one. Our mission is to recognize the accomplishments of women authors, to advance community dialogue about literature, and to raise money for nonprofit literary programs. I want to thank the volunteers on our committee for all of their hard work. Since the first year in 2009, they have presented over 55 authors and have raised over $350,000 for grants to the community. With the proceeds of our 2019 event, we were able to make grants to the One City, One Story program at the Pasadena Public Library, the Pasadena City College Writer-in-Residence, Visiting Writer, and Summer Creative Writing programs, the Pasadena Senior Center Masters in Learning program, the PEN America Emerging Voices Fellowship program, and Write Group. The signature of our festival is that our authors tell us their personal story, the story of their journey as a writer and as a woman. First, our author will be introduced by a member of our author selection committee. Then the author will speak about her journey. And lastly, there will be a question and answer session. Before we go to our author stories, I would like to thank our sponsors for their generosity. Our lead sponsor at the publisher level, Clifford Swan Investment Counselors, and our sponsors at the editor and novel levels. We hope that you'll consider making a donation and purchasing our author's books through the links at the end of this video or by going to our website. And now, enjoy this author's story. Hello, I'm Emily Vuitton, and I'm thrilled to be introducing Yang Shi Chu, author of The Night Tiger. Chu took readers and critics alike by storm with her first novel, The Ghost Bride. It was a New York Times bestseller and is now a six-part Netflix series. If you haven't seen it, get ready for some serious binge-watching. Her second novel, The Night Tiger, a selection of the Reese Witherspoon Book Club, is set in 1930s Malaysia. Quick-witted, ambitious Ji Lin wants to be a doctor, but is forced to work as a dance hall girl to settle her mother's mahjong debts. When one of her partners leaves behind a mummified finger, she goes looking for its owner. Meanwhile, Ren, an 11-year-old houseboy, is racing to fulfill his master's dying wish. He wants Ren to find his missing finger and bury it with his body so he won't turn into a man-eating tiger. Chu said the book required a lot of research. She spent many hours in the National Archives of Singapore, reading old newspapers, trying to figure out what the bounty was on man-eating tigers and what kind of parties went, people went to back then. The combination of mystery, romance, and historical settings has proven to be a heady mixture. The Authors Committee picked Chu because we fell in love with her storytelling and her ability to evoke lost worlds. The critics have fallen under Chu's spell as well. Booklist called The Night Tiger a work of incredible beauty. Thank you, Yang Shi, for joining us. We are so happy you're here. Thank you so much for having me and hello everyone. Um, I am so delighted to be with you today. And although we can't meet in person right now due to the pandemic, I'm glad that we have a chance to connect over a shared love of books and reading. I'm so glad you said that because one of the most special things about this festival is usually the energy of 750 enthusiastic readers. And um, I'm glad that we can be capturing some of that here with you today. So now we are thrilled and ready to hear about your journey as a writer and how that informed your writing of The Night Tiger. So reading has always been my solace and my comfort and my escape um, ever since I was little. And sometimes it feels like the only way to leave a room quietly is through the pages of a book. 
Now more than ever, when many of us are staying at home, which is in itself a privilege, it's the safest or perhaps the only way to travel. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my writing journey um, with my latest novel, The Night Tiger, and um, some of the behind the scenes on how it got here. So to begin with, The Night Tiger was not the original title of this novel. I am actually really bad at coming up with titles. Um, and the, you know, the original working title I had for the novel was The Coroner's Chinese Boy, which is what I floated the manuscript um, to my agent with. And she was like, you know, you might want to rethink it. I, I don't think it's a great title. So she said, why don't you go away and think about a title and I'll think about one too. So I thought and I thought and I came back to my agent and said, okay, okay, I've got another title. How about The Tiger's Hand? Because, you know, there I talk about the superstition of uh, men who turn into tigers. And my agent was like, no, 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 the tiger's hand is not a good title either. Can you think of another one? So I said, okay, I've got, I've got another one. What about the tiger's finger? Because, you know, there's a, there's a severed finger in the novel. And at which point my poor agent was like, she said, the tiger's finger is also not a good title. Um, it's very weird and not in a good way. So... <laughs> So she said she was going to think about it. And um, one day when I was uh, pushing my shopping cart around in Trader Joe's, um, I got the text from my agent and it said, she said, I've got a great title for you. And I said, what, what? And she said, I think we should call this book The Night Tiger. And, you know, I thought, well, that's a wonderful title. It's far better than anything that I came up with myself. Um, and which also goes to show you that a lot of good things happen in Trader Joe's. Um, I actually also heard about um, my first novel potentially becoming a Netflix series while I was in Trader Joe's. And I don't know whether that means I spend too much time in Trader Joe's or, or did pre-pandemic um, or that, you know, as I mentioned, good things happen in Trader Joe's. And in fact, I was so excited when I, I got a text about that. I almost drove my shopping cart into a large display of navel oranges. Um, so... To get back to the Night Tiger, now that it had this title, um, it is set in 1930s colonial Malaysia, where I'm from, and it was really inspired by a house, or perhaps I should say a certain kind of house. Those beautiful, crumbling, grand tropical houses with wide verandas and teak floors that were left behind by the British, many of which lie now in ruins. With their high ceilings and gracious windows, they spoke of a life that has vanished, a sort of Downton Abbey of the tropics with its shadowed interplay between servants and masters. So the night tiger came out of the secrets I imagined hidden in those houses, along with many of my favorite obsessions. So Chinese dance hall girls, twins, tigers who turn into men, a train that takes you to the world of the dead, and of course, a good old fashioned murder mystery. So when I was a little girl, there was an old house on the former millionaire's row in Ambang, Kuala Lumpur. It was built in 1929 by a wealthy Chinese businessman. And after his death, it was converted into a French restaurant, such being the fate of many large old houses. So it served very old fashioned colonial cuisine cooked by Hainanese chefs. So things like sizzling steak and consomme and thick slices of white bread spread with cold salted butter. So we went once for a special occasion. I think it was, um, I think it was my grandfather's birthday. And partway through dinner, I sneaked upstairs because I wanted to see the view of the huge balcony. It was a house that looked like something out of the Great Gatsby, you know, sort of all white with lots of pillars and staircases. And I think I told my parents that I was just going to the toilet and then on the way back, I sort of went up the steps. And that's part of the thrill of childhood, I think, that feeling of adventure and, and going where you're not supposed to. So upstairs in that house was like nothing I'd imagined. It was an enormous shadowy room, almost like a ballroom, lit only dimly by the light from the stairs. And it was completely empty. I suppose um, all the furniture had been sold, except for a tall, standing mirror like a like a gentleman's dressing mirror and 
I was terrified and yet fascinated. I don't know whether any of you have ever looked into a mirror at night in the darkness. And uh, that mirror really drew me. I had to nerve myself up to creep across the room and stare into its wavy old green glass. And I wondered what I'd see, whether it would be this world or another one, you know, some 1920s party perhaps with Chinese flappers and bobbed hair and men in tropical dinner suits. And there's some times in life, I think, when the skin between this world and the next seems very thin. And I always remember that feeling of wonder and terror and unexpected daring. So this idea of mirror worlds or parallel worlds of twins and servants and masters, the world of the living, the world of the dead, um, in the world of men and women, foreigners and locals, um, runs through the night tiger. Um, set in 1930s colonial Malay, it's a dual narrative. So the book itself is literally split in two uh, as well between Ji Lin, a dance hall girl whose client leaves her with a gruesome souvenir, and Ren, an 11-year-old Chinese houseboy who suspects his master, a British doctor, is actually a man-eating tiger. Um, so Ren and Ji Lin must discover whether the string of unexpected deaths that ties them together is due to coincidence or something stranger. So I've always been interested in parallel worlds and the fact that people, uh, it seems to me, are quite able of holding two contradictory ideas simultaneously. So for example, you might tell me that you're a data scientist and that you believe in facts. And at the same time, you might also tell me that last night you dreamed of your dead grandfather. And in which case I might ask you, well, you know, what did he say? And you might tell me, oh, well, you know, I've always thought that my grandfather had a personal message for me about the tree that was at the bottom of our garden. And, you know, and so, like I said, these are two contradictory ideas that we as humans are emotionally okay with. And speaking of parallels or mirror worlds, I've also always been fascinated by twins. So I spent part of my childhood in Germany. And one of the tales that really frightened me when I was young was the legend of the doppelganger. So you may know this story. You're walking along and in the distance, you see someone who looks familiar. Oh, you say to yourself, you know, I wonder who that is. And as you draw closer, you realize with dawning shock that it is yourself. And when you see yourself, when you, when you, when you lock eyes with your doppelganger, you will die shortly afterwards. So <laughs> it's a really cheerful story, you know, uh, right up there with other German classics like Struel Peter, the man with the large scissors. But um, I've always wondered, like, what, what does that story tell us about ourselves? Does it mean that when you see yourself, when you truly see yourself as other people see you, you must die or part of you must die? So um, while I was writing the novel, um, I thought about the ways in which we exist in two realities. Um, and as I mentioned, the book itself is split into the world of the living and the world of dreams and the world of servants and masters. And it may be quite hard to imagine, but not so long ago, child servants were actually quite commonplace and they still are very sadly in some parts of the world. So um, my mother, for example, did not go to school until she was 11 years old. Uh, my grandfather was a tin miner, um, which is actually both my grandfathers were tin miners. They worked at the open cast tin mines in the Kinta Valley, uh, right around where the book is set near outside of Ipoh. And my grandmother, um, my maternal grandmother, was a plantation worker. So she actually did the job that uh, one of the characters in the novel, Ambika, does. She was a rubber tapper, which meant that she got up very early in the day to, uh, to cut the bark of trees and collect the latex that turns in, or the sap of the trees that turns into rubber. So my mum was the middle child uh, of a large batch of children, and her oldest siblings went to the local government school down the road but she stayed home um, until she's 11 and uh, from the age of six um, my mum told me that she was in charge of cooking 
and cleaning and you know fetching water from the well and many many of the uh, instances in the novel the the chores that Ren does the houseboy um, are things that my mum did or, or that she taught me to do for example how to catch and butcher and pluck a chicken how to cook rice over a charcoal stove um, things like that um, so that that also all went into the novel as well um, and as an aside actually uh, when she was 11, my, my mum did go down and she went to the government primary school and registered herself and her next youngest brother. And I asked her, I said, you know, mummy, why, why did you do that? Because if she hadn't, she might well have been illiterate. You know, for example, my, um, my, my grandmother was illiterate and she, she never could read. And one of my earliest childhood memories of her was that um, it is actually very lonely and boring to be illiterate when everyone around you can read. So my grandfather could read because he had a primary six education, that is uh, elementary school education. So he could read, he would be sitting around reading his Chinese newspaper and we kids when we went to visit them, we'd all be reading our books and stuff. And my grandmother would be so lonely, like she'd be so bored. And, and she'd be like, all of you are reading and reading. And she's actually the one who also taught me to play mahjong because she was <laughs> really bored and needed people to play with her. Um, so to go back to that, uh, you know, we forget like what a gift reading is. And I did ask my mom, like, why did you go and register yourself? And she said it was because I, I also wanted to read. I did not want to be left behind. Um, and my mom in the end actually made it all the way to university. But more about my mom later. So when my mom was still at home before she had gone to school and when she was about eight years old, she had a friend um, she told me, who was a few years older than her, maybe, I don't know, 13 or so, who worked as a servant in one of these great British colonial houses. And my mum told me that one day she went to visit her friend in the kitchen. And as Malaysia is a tropical country, it was very hot. And her friend said she would give her a treat um, and that she would give my mother a glass of ice water. It was the first ice that my mother had ever had in her life, and she said it was amazing. Like she'd never experienced anything so cold before. And I thought when I heard this story as well about how wondrously strange it must have been, and also how in those great houses, the masters had no idea what the servants were up to. I mean, you had no idea that your child servant is letting other children, you know, come in and tour your house and say, look, this is the icebox, you know, this is our gas stove. So speaking of my mum, when I told her what I was writing about this time, um, she did say to me, um, she said, your first book, The Ghost Bride, was about the marriage of the dead. And this book is about man eating tigers. Why don't you write something cheerful and uplifting <laughs> as you can guess my mum is also the kind of person who's always told me like why don't you wear some nice bright colors and, and put some lipstick on as well so i could only reply to her that um i found it very interesting and in fact i think that one should always write about things that one finds deeply fascinating otherwise the reader will also feel your lack of interest so one of my greatest regrets is that I, um, I spent my senior year in university writing an incredibly boring thesis. Um, I'd originally wanted to write about Chinese female ghosts and why they are so much more frightening than the male ones. It is the women who have died in childbirth or committed suicide after being betrayed in love that are truly terrifying. And I've always thought that it's the guilt of the men who oppress them in a patriarchal society that's found its outlet in its fear of dead women. But I did not write that thesis. I was, um, I was really worried that nobody would employ me after I graduated if they discovered I had written about ghosts. So instead, I wrote my thesis on Chinese economic industrial townships. And uh, it was so boring that even I could barely read it without numbing myself with first with a large bag of Cheetos. So, you know, my poor thesis advisor and I would meet early in the morning and we would sit and look at each other 
he was this grad student from Korea and I sometimes wondered whether he got assigned to me because we were both international students and I would think poor you having to advise me <laughs> but all was not lost I wrote about female ghosts in my first book The Ghost Bride and they appear in the night time as well those women with long black hair who come in the night and call you out with sweet voices though you should never open the door for them as for the man-eating tigers that my mum was complaining about i've always been fascinated by the idea of shapeshifters and in particular how they are different in asia versus the west so in, in europe as you as you all know the werewolf is a man who changes his skin and goes out from the village into the forest to kill and eat. However, in Southeast Asia and modern and Southern China, the weir tiger is not a man, but a beast. It is an animal that wears a human skin and comes from the jungle to knock on your door and eat you in your home. It is almost exactly the opposite and very disturbing. So, this attitude towards shapeshifters, I think, is more nuanced in Asia. In Europe, particularly the Victorian Gothic novels that I spent so much time reading as a child, the werewolf is seen as a vermin to be exterminated with pitchforks. In Asia, however, there is great respect for the tiger. And in some parts of Indonesia, it was believed that the souls of ancestors were reincarnated into tigers. And in Malaysia, the tiger was addressed as Datuk or Sir, and hunters would ask for permission from the tiger before they enter the jungle. In fact, there's a long literary precedent of animals assuming human form. Part of this is the Taoist philosophy of magic and folk tale and the thin veil between the worlds. You see, classical Chinese literature is full of these transformations and transmutations. So, for example, there's a belief that a snake can become a dragon. And if a fox can survive for a hundred years, it will gain 10 white hairs in its tail. And when it has turned completely white, it can assume the form of a beautiful woman. So who is the hunter and who is the prey? What is human and what is a beast? When you stare into a mirror, do you see a reflection or a world of dreams and forbidden love that beckons you? It's a world that I find deeply transporting, and I hope you enjoy it too. Thank you. That was captivating, Yang Chi, and I felt like you did take me on a journey outside of my house where I have been for many months. So thank you so much. Oh, you're most welcome. And it was, it's, it was very fun. Although it's, it's sad to do this without seeing people. <laughs> <laughs> finding like you know because you always think like was this funny was it am i the only person you think this is funny so i i was laughing out loud <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know how people are doing like any other kind of thing like stand-up comics who knows so <laughs> yes well i'm sure my teenagers are wondering what i'm doing but i was laughing out loud so <laughs> i thought that's it was very kind of you <laughs> thank you so we do have some questions from our audience. Our first question is from Chris Finney. Hi, I'm Chris Finney and I am the co-chair of operations for the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors. And I was wondering what your process is like for writing during this time of quarantining. Well, um, I, I'm wondering whether it's any different from normal other than the house being full of screaming children. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I actually spend a lot of time, well, I don't really outline, which I wish I did, you see. Um, and uh, I actually have a number of friends who are authors and who, who write outlines. And I, I'm so in awe of that. I really admire it because they like chapter one, this happened, chapter two, chapter three. And I actually never know where the, the story is going to go until I start writing it. So to me, writing has always been rather like riding a bicycle at night with no lights. <laughs> so, and sometimes, you know, things go well. You're like, oh, I hit a slope, wee, you know. And other times, like, oh, my 
goodness, it was an elephant around the corner. Terrible. Um, and a number of times I've actually had to, you know, with both novels, I'm a very slow writer. I've actually had to put the book aside um, because I thought, like, who, who is the fool who wrote this book? Oh, it's me. Oh, you know, so getting stuck. So I, I'm still going through that. Like that, none of that has changed in uh, lockdown. I haven't magically been able to uh, write outlines. Um, my husband did say, he's like, if you only wrote an outline, there would be less of this like crying and howling and rolling around on the floor. <laughs> so <laughs> I, as you guys have mentioned it, I like to sit on the floor and work on a coffee table when I'm writing. Um, at one point, like a couple of months ago, I decided that the ha we live in a very small house and that it was so noisy, like with my kids on Zoom and my husband was like on Zoom and he's, he's very loud. So you can hear him everywhere going, ha, 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 great idea. <laughs> Stop. So I decided that I would become nocturnal, like one of those, you know, lemurs. And uh, I, I decided that I would write from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. And it was a grand idea. It, it actually, it, it sort of worked because I need to write when it's silent. But it, it did make me very, very tired because I'm not naturally a night person. And then I also think like going through, then I would wake up at 10 o'clock in, in the morning and then go through the day and then you think like oh my goodness like 11 p.m is coming that is when i must start work so i i would say it was somewhat partially successful i did my show a bit but not a lot so i've switched back to mornings now <laughs> i wish i could tell you that i get up at 5 a.m and then I, I lift weights and then I, I run around the block but you know it's nothing like that <laughs> thank you next we have a question from liz Thank you, Yangtze. We really enjoy that. Fascinating. Uh, my name is Liz White, and I am on the author selection committee and uh, of the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors. And my question for you is, why did you use two narrators in The Night Tiger? Hmm, why did I? <laughs> it's like, behind the curtain, there's nothing but like, 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 eating chocolate and thinking like why did that um well you know I'd never done that before so it was a bit of a first for me but initially I'd started writing the novel from just one point of view and that was um it was third person it was Ren which is a house boy and then you get a lot of William who is his master and I really felt like I had so many ideas for the book like lots and lots of other like plot twists actually we had to cut the book in half in the end because it was too long um and I, I felt like couldn't I couldn't get it all in on one side. And when I started to write um, Ji Lin's perspective, that's the dance hall girl, her narrative came out in first person. Um, so I was wondering, should I write the book in third? Should I write it first? And then I thought, why don't I kind of like s squish them together? It's like the kitchen sink, let's try them both. Now in general, I would say this is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> like put everything together and see what happens um but it, it sort of worked out in this sense because i feel like it helps the novel to move faster because when you and also uh, to me at least because a lot of the book was about this world and the next you know that the, the alternate realities which we live in i thought it was really interesting to have the narrative divided so it's literally divided into two you know um and so while one, something's going on here, something else is going on there, and you, and you start to wonder as a reader, like, what's really true, you know, which is a story. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you could read this as a straightforward murder mystery, and you can also read it as a ghost story, or you can read it as both, <laughs> ghost and murder mystery. <laughs> so that's what happened. And then when I was writing a novel, I actually did something with the, with the two narratives, in which one is a third person present tense and the other narrative is first person past tense and I don't know whether you you picked up on that or not while you're reading it but I did that to make them feel about the same distance from you as a reader because okay. because third person's always a little bit further but if you make it present it brings you up close and then I compensated with you know first person past and I also wanted um, to make it sure that as a reader, if you open the book at any page and you started reading, that you would know instantly which narrative you were in. Um, anyway, that was my hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a question from Grace. 
Hi, uh, I'm Grace. I'm an alumni for Right Girl. Uh, and my question is, how do you manage to balance the world of the supernatural with the real world throughout your novel? Hmm. This is another one of those, hmm, did I, did it? I wish I didn't outline. <laughs> I, I, I didn't actually, I did not actually think about it um, maybe because as I, as I had confessed, I did not have an outline, but I wrote the novel very much as, as you read it, you know. People have sometimes asked me, like, did you write all one narrative and then you wrote, wrote the other one? But when I was writing the book, I really wrote like one chapter, one chapter, one chapter, one chapter. And so um, as the book, un as a story sort of unfurled by itself, um, I, I was also discovering things along the way. <laughs> Uh, so sometimes, and I, I have actually discovered that this is um, true of a lot of writers I've talked to, they're like, you know, when things are going well, when you know your characters well, um, they start to speak to you in your head, and then you look like uh, a slightly demented person as you, <laughs> so like, like, hmm, you know, talking for two people. Like, <laughs> so um, that's, that's what happened with the novel. I did not consciously um, separate out uh, the sort of supernatural elements from the non-supernatural, because to me, the entire story was imbued with the idea of living um, in a world where everything seems possible. And part, you know, part of the narrative is also um, done by Ren, who is an 11-year-old boy. And I don't know whether you remember what it's like to be a child when things seem like, when magic almost seems possible. You know, if you tell yourself, if I do this right, and I walk around the tree Widdershins, then on my way home, I will, find, uh, I will find a turkey egg. And then you do, and you're like, oh, it's the best day of my life. You know, so I feel like we've always, we're always looking in some ways for signs and um, meaning in our lives. And when I was writing the novel, I thought that um, that just sort of crossed over into everything. You know, characters, it came out, and, it, and a lot of the novel is also... Uh, discusses dreams and dreams in and of themselves often feel like signs and portents um, to us. Actually, I read somewhere that one of the things that sets human beings apart is our ability to constantly search for meaning in everything, you know, and I think that is a strength and also a weakness because um, sometimes you might spend your entire life like looking for the waiting for the third branch of the whatever, you know, things to drop on your, you know, so that's, that, that is, like I said, as both a strength and a, we a weakness and also a mystery. So I just sort of let that wrap up. I hope that made sense. Um, that made, per everything about that made perfect sense to me. Um, the follow-up question I had was, do you feel like we live in a world where almost everything is possible? Um, as far as like the, you talked about places where the skin between the two worlds is very thin. Do you feel like that's a thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do well. actually. No, no, I do. Sometimes, I mean, and, that, and it's a very emotional thing. So, in, so certainly, I, I'm sure that you have, for example, gone to a house that you instantly dislike. You feel like, I don't like this place, you know, or I, I don't want to stay, I don't want to sleep here overnight, let's move. Um, and, and that might just be your subconscious picking things up. And other times you might um, meet someone or be somewhere when you feel like, wow, I feel like this is my lucky day. You know, so it's, it's really weird. A lot of it is, I think, highly emotional. But then the question you have to ask yourself is what is your reality? What defines your reality? Is it your emotion at the moment? Or is your emotion also picking up from all sorts of things around the world? And I think that's why um, everybody's path um, through everyday life is different, you know, depending on where you are, how you are feeling. And like I said, um, I think there is a part of all of us that is always looking for magic, you know, and that would not be totally unsurprised if something, something magical happened. You know, we would be surprised, but not surprised. You know, to give you an example, when I was a little kid, um, my sister, my older sister, explained to me that there were fairies at the bottom of our garden and that the fairies particularly loved her. And, she, and you know, because of that, you know, certain flowers would be blo in bloom in certain days. And I, I totally believed her. And then one day I said to her, well, the sun loves me. When I go out of the house, it's going to be sunny. And we happened, so I stepped out of the door and it was sunny. And then I went in again, for some reason, a cloud went over. 
and I went out again, it was sunny. And then for years afterwards, I was absolutely convinced that I could control the weather. <laughs> So you know, I, was, I was six at the time, but these are, you know, you can call it what you like. Is it coincidence? It, it depends on you as a child. What did you believe? You know, of course we grew up and I realized that I could not control the weather. Look, it rained on the soccer game, but um, it's just funny. You know, it's, I feel like that sense of magic and wonder is always within each of us uh, and it doesn't really go away. Oh my goodness. That's wonderful. The way you talk about childhood is in, in capture. It's, Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Our next question is from Shelley. Uh, thank you, Yangtze. I really loved your presentation. I thought it was fascinating, and I haven't read the book yet, so I'm really looking forward to reading it now. My name is Shelley Thompson. I'm on the board of the Literary Alliance and on the executive committee of the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors. So my question is, both The Night Tiger and The Ghost Bride uh, are historical novels and they take place in uh, two different time frames in Malaysia. What draws you to the historical novel uh, form? Mm. Well, I, you know, I've always felt that as somebody put it so eloquently, the past is another country. And uh, growing up, I, I think um, I saw a lot of uh, for example, for Night Tiger, I mentioned that there are these old colonial houses. And so when I saw them um, and visited them as a child, I really wondered what life was like at the time. Um, and the same thing with other things that you see in museums, like um, Malaysia used to use tin money. Uh, the money was tin ingots, which was shaped like animals, like tortoises and other things. And sometimes in order to pay people, you would like, because tin is very soft, you break off a bit of your animal, like a tortoise arm or leg, and then weigh it and then pay <laughs> some with it. You know, I saw this, these things as a child like in museums and I'd wonder like, what was it like to live in the time in which you could be paid in tin tortoise money and like parts of like two legs and a body, you know, so <laughs> that, that goes from the 1890s. Um, so things like that just get, get you started thinking. And I think the wonderful thing about writing historical novels is that things are the same, but they're not the same. You know, so places that you think, you know, now look so very different back then. So that's part of it. Um, I've always enjoyed um, historical novels. Um, and I also think we learn a lot from history. Um, otherwise, what is it? We don't learn. Otherwise, whoever does not learn from history is doomed to repeat it. So <laughs> I'm thinking all these truisms, which I've like started yeah, off so to my true. children. <laughs> so, like, um, yeah, but I've, I've always found it fascinating. And if you think about history, you know, um, now I think we can visualize history far better than we ever could before because of photographs. You know, we've got black and white photographs of things going back at least 100 years or more. And when, um, when you think about it, if you, it's a place that you know and then you see the photograph from 100 years ago, it's almost like seeing um, like, like a window into the past or when you stand in an old house and you can see the marks of life in it. For example, you notice how small the doors are or the fact that the second step is worn down. Why? Is it because that's where the women used to stand on the se second step and listen to what was going on? You know, you see all the marks of life and you can't help, at least I can't, um, but imagine what was going on then. And then you start to write your story. So that's part of it. What a great answer, I have to say. I love historical novels, so I really appreciate that insight. Thank you. Thank you as well. Our next question comes from Teresa. Hi, Yangtze. That was such a wonderful talk. I'm Teresa Payton with the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors Book Selection Committee. And we loved your book early on, right after it was published. Um, you know, twins, real and quasi, are a big theme in The Night Tiger. And I know you address duality a little bit, but why is this notion so important to you in the book? Well, um, I've always just found twins fascinating. You know, part of it is because when I was in school, we actually had a set of twins, a pair of twins who were identical twins um, when I was growing up, but had completely different personalities. And meeting them, one could not help but wonder about souls. Like, you know, you look the same, but you're completely different. And you can tell 
Um, I mean, even, even their voices sounded the same, but when they started talking, you could figure out, oh, that's so-and-so because this is their interest, etc. cetera. Um, that's part of it. And the other part of it, as I mentioned, is um, my childhood terror and fascination with the doppelganger, you know? So <laughs> that whole thing of what, you know, somebody that looks like you, but isn't you and is leading a different life, you know, now we also talk about things like parallel worlds, parallel universes, um, but, but it's always been fascinating to me, partly because it speaks to the idea of possibility. You know, I, I think there was a movie about the sliding doors or something, but that's something that I'm sure that occurs to all of us. Like if that day, if you had gone to, um, if you had gone to Walgreens rather than CVS, what would have happened? You know, what would have happened if you'd taken that trip or not taken the train? Uh, life is just full of possibilities. And you could also say that stories are also made of possibilities. You know, uh, what if I, I actually remember talking to a young writer once who and she mentioned to me that she was thinking of writing a memoir um, of things that had happened in her family, although that she felt like, well, it was interesting, but not interesting enough. And so I'd said to her, why don't you make it fiction instead of memoir? And then you take the other route, the possibilities. What if, you know, that day your brother, instead of staying home, had actually gone out instead? And so I, um, I realized that that's the underpinning of a lot of fiction as well. It is the alternate possibility, things happening to you, the same you again, or uh, transforming you. So that might be it. And, and then besides that, just, just being fascinated with twins. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know whether you've also ever thought like, if there was another me, then I could do my homework twice as fast. You know, if there were three me's, like one of us could go grocery shopping, but what will happen with, you know, then you, then you, you get into the whole like, are we changing the warp of the universe? Who knows? So, um, and, and maybe another part of that is the question of one's existence. You know, you know what does one's existence mean? And uh, what does it mean if you did something else or somebody wasn't you? So I do think that that actually, the idea of twins or another life or a double has occurred in so many um, literary devices, like Shakespeare used that a lot, you know, yeah. a lot. Um, and then even like, it even goes into novels like Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, in which she's haunted by the ghost of another, another Mrs. Um, I forgot her la the last name, but you know, the, the, the other wife, wife, like the new wife and the old right. wife, you know, what, what does that mean? So yeah. twins are everywhere, I think, if you look for them. Well, I, I hope you have some. <laughs> no, I have, I have just single children, but that's, that's actually quite a lot of work. I really, I really <laughs> admire people who, who have twins in real life. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. My final question is, what was the most interesting thing you learned while researching the night tiger? Hmm. You know, I, so I think one of the most wonderful things about writing fiction is that one can turn all of one's hobbies into research. So you're like, I really needed to research like tea cakes and things like that. And, um, and uh, so you can, one can go down a, a lot of different rabbit holes and I have to confess that I've gone down many, many of them. Um, I, for example, I really like animals. And at one point I had all these books about tigers, you know, man eaters of the Malay Peninsula and statistics on the 1930s, like how many tigers were killed, how many, um, how many leopards were hunted. And my parents came to visit me and, and my mom did say, she said like, why do you have all these books? why don't you have cheerful books? <laughs> so she was like not, not particularly happy that I was looking into all these man-eating tiger books. Um, um, and, and that was really interesting. It really was interesting to learn about exactly how many animals we've had. I mean, Malaysia still has quite a lot of jungle and there's still many animals that are very secretive, that, only, that they're all around you, but you won't see them because they're really good at hiding. So um, that was fun. And the other thing that was actually fun for me was uh, researching food in the 1930s. And I'd actually read this book before I started, the, just before I started my book called The Raj at Table. And it's really wonderful. It's like a, a history of um, British, like co uh, colo colonial 
cookery. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and the things that they ate, you know, uh, because they, they wanted to eat like mutton, for example, saddles of mutton in India when it was very hot and you could not like keep the meat and hang it up. So I, I found that fascinating. Um, and I, I also read a lot of old, uh, like vintage cookbooks to sort of get the dishes right for William's parties in, in the novel. Um, and then I, I cook some of the dishes from that. So my, my kids are like, why are we eating this for the third time? I'm like, I just had to get it right. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of the food is still somewhat similar. I mean, we call uh, like old fashioned food. Uh, and the other thing that was fun to find out was that uh, how much of a cachet like tins had, like people were really into tinned food because it, would, it was fancy and had, you know, come from Europe. So you would open like this pate is from France, you know, rather than eating something that was local. Um, but that was, that was all very, very fun. Um, I could go, go on. <laughs> you probably want, you probably oh. want to be oh, now <laughs> about all the many fun things that you find. And then there's usually too many to put into a novel. You know, I think this is a problem with, with many, many novelists is that you find so many extras and then sometimes you say to yourself like I just need to put in this long section actually we had to remove things in the novel like I had this whole thing about how to make omelets over a charcoal fire because you know you can't adjust the fire and then my agent was like why is there like two pages of omelet making in this novel <laughs> so we removed that and then I also learned how I, I learned some dressmaking as well because in, in the novel she's a dressmaker and, and I had actually thought I spent so long like learning how to make a shaper you know which is like a, a basic thing um, maybe I should and I wrote up how to do it and I thought this is terrible it's like a really bad like do-it-yourself manual so I had to take it out of the book too. Thank you so much I was just going to say I loved reading about the fashion her, her wardrobe that was fun too. We could go down another rabbit hole with that. Yes, all, all of the all of the the details were just made the story so so lovely, and um, we have really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you. It's it's been my pleasure and such an honor. Um, I can't tell you what an honor it was to be invited to the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors. Uh, I I feel so very grateful that anyone has read this book at all so um thank you and it's been such a fun conversation as well we so appreciate you taking the time to be with us yang Shi, and for sharing your magical story with the world and thank you to our zoom audience we're so happy to have you here as you know the pasadena festival of women authors was created to amplify the voices of emerging and established female authors we achieve this by bringing you exceptional content, such as this conversation with Yang Shi Chu. We encourage you to support her and all the authors we featured by buying their books. The Pasadena Festival of Women Authors also provides grants to literary organizations in the Pasadena and Los Angeles area. And we'd be grateful for donations in any amount. Links for both of these things can be found at the end of this video, as well as on our website, www.pasadenaliteraryalliance.org. And if you enjoyed today's interview, please also share on your social feeds and spread the word about the work of the Pasadena Literary Alliance and the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors. Thank you so much.